Two years ago, Kevin Barnetation entitled The ABCs of the Book of Abraham, or The Book of Abraham for Dummies. In that presentation, we talked about the history of the papyri, how they got to Joseph, and what happened to them after Joseph died. Kevin also provided a bibliography of the scholarly approaches to the Book of Abraham, the sources uh, for further study, and some of the criticisms against the book. Today I'm going to focus on some of those critical arguments and some possible solutions. As a brief recap, among the scrolls owned by Joseph Smith, the most closely associated with the Book of Abraham is a scroll owned by an Egyptian named Horus, or Hor. This scroll contained at least a couple of drawings, or vignettes. An, L an early LDS woodcutter, Reuben Headlock, created woodcut facsimiles of the vignettes so that copies could be reprinted in the Times and Seasons and later in the Pearl of Great Price. Facsimile one and three are from the scroll of Horus. The original uh, vignette for facsimile three has never been found. After translation, some of the scrolls were cut into pieces, glued to a backing paper, and mounted under glass so they could be viewed by others. Some of the scrolls of Horus and parts of the other scrolls from Joseph Smith's collection were eventually lost or destroyed in the Chicago fire in 1871 while they resided in a museum. In 1967, several scroll fragments, including some important pieces of the scroll of Horus, were rediscovered and given to the church. At around the same time, Gerald and Sandra Tanner, uh, two critics of the church, published an underground copy of parts of the Kirtland Egyptian papers, or the KEP as abbreviated. These papers, which will be dealt with uh, in much greater detail tomorrow by Brian Hoglet, have been in the church's possession since the days of Joseph, but have been virtually unnoticed until the early 19th century. The Kirtland Egyptian papers are not ancient papyri, but are instead papers from Joseph and his contemporaries that have a relationship to the study and translation of the papyri. Early on, even before the fragments were discovered, some scholars suspected that at least some portions of the facsimiles had parts missing and had been inaccurately restored when they were printed. Later, other non-LDS scholars agreed, and there was a general consensus that not only were these facsimiles restored incorrectly, but also that Joseph's interpretation of the facsimiles did not accurately reflect the understanding of Egyptologists. Among the Kirtland Egyptian papers is a hand-drawn copy of facsimile 2. Facsimile 2 comes from a hypocephalus, which is a small funerary amulet, it's a disc, that was placed under the head of the deceased Egyptian. They believed it would magically cause the head and body to be enveloped in flames or radiance, thus making the deceased divine. You can see in this drawing that facsimile 2, as owned by Joseph, did indeed have pieces missing. The missing parts, the whole is also called the lacuna, um, was restored for publication. Now, most non-LDS scholars agree that these restorations are inaccurate, and we'll come back to the restorations later. Facsimile 1 also had a lacuna, and we'll discuss the uh, restorations on that later as well. Of the 11 extant or surviving papyri fragments, several pieces belong to the scroll of Horus. When pieced together, we find that there is a gap between facsimile 1 and facsimile 3, which probably came near the end of the scroll, and the rest of the papyri, at least the end of the uh, what's called the Simpson text. Uh, there's parts missing. So the, the part to the right there and the color is what we have, and then we don't have everything to the left, but we're, we're sure that, uh, pretty sure that facsimile 3 was at the later part. The text of, of this scroll tells us that it is somewhat common uh, Egyptian funerary text known as the Book of Breathings. And I've got a part there in red that you can see over here. And of course, you can see in the round, and I'm showing on one side here, but this is facsimile one. You can see the Abraham on the lion couch. This part here we're going to be talking about a little bit, but this is called the small sense and text. And uh, these are instructions for the deceased in the afterlife. Such a scroll was commonly included in Egyptian burials. In the scholarly world, this type of scroll is also referred to as the documents of breathings made by Isis, or the breathings permit, or the sense and text. The word breathing is supposedly translated from the Egyptian sense. And I talked to uh, Dr. John Gee as I was preparing this, and uh, he said he's recently argued that that's a mistranslation, that it's not breathing, so that sense doesn't mean that. I would like to examine the three most common arguments relating to the Joseph Smith papyri and Joseph Smith's translation in the Book of Abraham. First, the age of the text versus the age of the papyri. Secondly, the restorations of the facsimiles. 
And then third, the relationship between the sense and text in the book of Abraham. So first, the date of the text and, and the papyri. When Joseph obtained the papyri in 1835, he reportedly said that one of the scrolls contained the writings of Abraham. According to Joseph's scribes, this scroll was written by Abraham's own hand upon papyrus. It seems reasonable to conclude that Joseph may have believed that Abraham himself, with pen in hand, wrote most of the very words that he was translating. The problem is that modern scholars, including LDS scholars, date the papyri to a few centuries before Christ, whereas Abraham lived about two millennium before Christ. Obviously, Abraham could not have penned the papyri himself. Now, this issue is very similar to that of Book of Mormon geography. It is very likely that Joseph believed in a hemispheric Book of Mormon geography. It made sense to his understanding of the world around him. Such a misinformed belief, or most likely misinformed belief, according to modern scholarship, makes him no less a prophet. It simply provides us with an example of how Joseph, like any other human, tried to understand new information according to his current knowledge. So likewise with the Abrahamic papyri. Joseph, by way of revelation, saw the papyri contained scriptural teachings of Abraham, and it would have been natural, therefore, to assume that Abraham wrote the papyri. But how could the teachings of Abraham be present on a document written 2,000 years after Abraham lived? As Dr. Gee notes, we find the same thing with biblical manuscripts. There is a major difference, he explains, between the date of the text, the information contained on the papyri, the papyri, and the date of the manuscript, which is the papyri itself. The date of the text is a date when the text was written by its author. A text can be copied into various manuscripts or translated into other languages. And these manuscripts or translations will have different later dates than the date of the original text. When we refer to the date of a text, we refer to the date of the original text. For example, the text of the Gospel of Matthew was written in the first century AD. But the earliest manuscript that we have of Matthew was copied in the third century AD, a couple hundred years later. Some scholars propose that the original Book of Abraham text was written by Abraham and then passed down through his descendants, the Jews, uh, some of whom took a copy to Egypt where it was copied after being translated on later manuscripts. And of course the manuscript then would have a later date. Okay, let's move to the restoration of the facsimiles. It seems obvious in at least some instances that when the drawings were quote unquote restored, and printed for LDS publications that the restorations of the lacuna were done without inspiration. When we look at the restorations in facsimile 2, for instance, we see that at least some of the restorations were obviously taken from the text of the Sensen text, or on one of, or another one of Joe's scrolls, the Book of the Dead, the different parts. So we can see here that this part is here, they, that it was filled in in some of the missing pieces. So he just kind of took some of the Egyptian parts. When we look at uh, the restorations of facsimile 1, we see that the missing portions were penciled on the backing paper to which they were glued before being mounted. This is how facsimile 1 looks in restored LDS scripture. See the lion couch in both to kind of get your bearings. According to some LDS scholars, this is more likely how facsimile 1 would have looked. According to the critics, facsimile 1 appears to be a fairly typical scene from Egyptian funerary text. The critics note that other similar Egyptian motifs depict Osiris on the lion couch and the priest and embalmer with the head of a jackal, Anubis, an Egyptian god, rather than a bald human head. Other comparable Egyptian embalming scenes do not show the priest holding a knife, and they do not show a man pleading or praying, and they generally show two hawks. The critics claim that Joseph drew in the missing parts by adding incorrectly those things which he, we find in the LDS version of the Egyptian scene. What Joseph saw as the fingers of Abraham's outstretched hands, for instance, were actually, according to the critics, wingtips of the missing second hawk as redrawn by the critics. Now, some of you may have noticed the blue dot on the anti-Mormon reconstruction. This is to cover the obscene ithophallic that they claim would have been in the original vignette. Ed Ashment, who is more informed, who is more informed on Egyptology than most critics, did not include this in his reconstruction. Now, all anti-Mormon sites that I was able to find on the internet who had a reconstruction of facsimile one seemed to follow Charles Larson, the upper one, uh, reconstruction with an ithphallic figure. And it's possible that Larson may have followed non-LDS Richard Packer's 1968 claim that the Osiris figure 